novels are world famous and his book, The War Against Cliché, proves him to be one of the select few critics who raise literary journalism to an art form. He has always found talking on television impossibly restrictive, but this is the first interview in which he has been allowed to smoke and have a drink while doing so. Martin Amos, novelist and critic, these two things don't often happen nowadays, do they? Very much. It's true, and uh, it's like, um, you know, the poet novelist. There's Updike, and I think, you know, then at Nabokov, but it, they're a dying breed and have been for some time. Uh, we live, and indeed, uh, but we live in the time of increasing specialization. I hate it. Yeah. Um, it's, it, uh, it's very uh, inhibiting, I think, and it also um, makes people more remote from each other, and um, they have their own value systems, and um, the, you know, the community, the intellectual community is gone. Well, I must say, though, I think you're the kind of critic that a novelist ought to dream of, because you stay with an author that you appreciate and somebody like Philip Roth, for example. But he, does, he doesn't appreciate it. Then exactly, because you actually take the, uh, the novelist at his best estimation, and you can be very, very tough when you think you're singing below it. I was very interested in your criticism of Roth. Uh, first of all, I, I agree with you. I think a whole generation agrees that no author in modern history made a more stunning beginning than Portnoy's complaint. It's well, th that was his third, fourth novel. We call it his beginning, or well, you think of it. Yeah. He did the apprentice work, and then comes the, the talent novel, and that was his talent novel, where he, he you know, said goodbye to form and, and trusted to the voice. And it was a stunning uh, appearance. I've got my, my favorite scenes and even my favorite lines, and uh, where he's frantically trying to impress the wasp girl and pretending he's not Jewish, he's, he's not, not bored, nor and he calls himself... <laughs> Because it's all port noir, right? <laughs> and when he's um, grilling his friend, who's just um, had filatio from the Italian uh, ironing lady, who's complained, <laughs> and he says, just after you left, right after you left, she was down on her lousy dago knees uh, performing filatio, and he says, tell me everything about it. Tell me about it in incredible detail. Do you put it in, or does she put it in? Or does it just get it? <laughs> <laughs> and you can hear the rhythm in the prose. It, there, it, was, it was unbeatable at writing uh, spoken. Wonderful, wonderful year. But he's, he's shortchanged us a bit on the humour, hasn't he? I mean, well, you say so, and uh, I think you think a bit less of the Zuckerman books as a whole than I do, but it's undoubtedly true that he got less funny. Uh, he hoarded his, you know, he's a humour hoarder. Um, and you do want him to... I, he always strikes me as a writer who's looking for a, a decorous way to explode, as I put it. You know, he, he's, because he's a great moralist as well, and, and you know, a great product of the crew-necked, serious 50s. And, uh, and he would have read his Levis and his... You know. Oh, sure, and he was a great student. Uh, you know, his, his essays on Kafka are impeccably crafted academic works in addition to everything else they are. I think he did a, a new phase of outrage actually in Israel and in, l later on. The Counterlife was, his, was a, a liberating book for him and, and kind of the, such a perfect postmodern novel that it retires the genre in a way. You, uh, he does raise a, a question which uh, I think your whole, book of, uh, your whole book of criticism raises and your whole attitude towards this. You have very, very high aesthetic requirements and you identify the aesthetic performance with morality. In fact, morality is contained within aesthetics. And I just wonder to what extent that it's true. It's true, but is it true enough? Because there must, surely must be some, some, some such thing as a great stylist who you also find does not make an adequate approach uh, or a response to morally to life. Well, um, I've been looking at the Stalin period, and um, there you see crystallized the real crux of, of writing as it relates to politics. Um, there, are only, there, are, there are only three things you could do in, under the regime, which is um, silence. Was it Babel who said, I've, I've invented a new genre, that of silence? And even that could be dangerous. That could be dangerous. Um, cooperating with the regime. Bad books. Bad books or um, suicide. 
defamation of some kind, deformation and or suicide. And what Stalin did and what Hitler did and what politics does do um, in you know, more, more or less extreme cases is that it, it, you find out how good you are. Because if you're good, you're, only luck can save you. Um, as it say, Pasternak, uh, for instance. Um, because you can't cooperate, because it is of the soul. And if you do, Gorky is the most tragic example, who, who wavered back and forth. And, and, and then when he did, you know, he refound his in integrity, which had been, you know, prostituted on several occasions, um, then, you know, it seems likely that Stalin rubbed him out. Uh, but he, he had the most deformed experience. Mayakovsky, you know, I, I think talented. Don't you? He's hugely talented. Yeah, and and suicide. You know, as they say in Russia, he, he stepped on the throat of his own song. Uh, he finally found that the only way to stop writing was to was to die. Yeah. So so you know, usually writers um, never find out how, how good they are because the argument starts with the obituaries, um, and that keeps you honest. You know, but um, in Russia, you found out. Well, I must say, I'm, I'm putting myself in danger because the, the danger with the argument that I'm propounding is that the people who actually do treat the big subjects in spite of all, like Nadezhda Mandelstam, who did write a great book. Two great books. Uh, Hope Against Hope is a truly great book, and so is the second book, Hope Abandoned. Um, I think there's probably the great, uh, if I say, it's probably meaningless to say so, but if it was a great prose book of the century, I would call it Hope Against Hope. But uh, it's, there's a great danger in, well, there's a the great... The Gulag <laughs> Archipelago. Well, that's a greatly, greatly effective book. But I think hope against the hope, if, if they... As in, well, it mm, could be argued. But uh, the danger is to think that it takes extreme experience to make greatness, and I don't, I don't quite believe that. It's, it's more uh, common that the extreme experience will distort, and it, it will bleach out all the rest of life. And Desna Mandelstam said so, that the trouble with our experiences is that it removed us from the privilege of ordinary heartbreaks of everyday life. Yeah. So that, that, that's the, the, the weakness in my argument I already know, but... The point I keep returning to, especially with Borges, is that this is the fundamental condition of the country you're living in. So you have to say, if you, if you don't treat it or take it in any way or even pointedly ignore it, you're really saying you're living in another world, which is the aesthetic world. There's a danger of a, an aestheticized world. Well, I mean, every writer would have to consider how he or she would behave in similar circumstances. Uh, how would you do under Stalin? I know how, how I would do. I would write, uh, I would be called in after a while. Um, then I would write four or five short stories about, you know, love beneath the tractor or, you know. Uh, no, you probably, you would have been. Th then I would kill myself. <laughs> you would probably be Bulgakov, who, 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 whose, whose, whose uh, destiny was far more contorted than that and wrote some very, very important books and then broke his heart. And uh, I know what, what, what would happen to me. I, my, in my wish, I would emigrate immediately. In fact, a little bit before the revolution, <laughs> which is more or less what Nabokov did, was it? Right? During the revolution, um, he was in the Volga getting on those books. That, that would be my wish, and I would go into exile and become an important international writer. But what I fear, and I think I, I try and follow uh, Labriere's precept that self-indulgence and severity towards others are the same vice. In other words, you should judge, judge yourself as harshly as possible in the light of what you know about yourself. I've got a terrible feeling I would have been Ilya Ehrenberg. Not was a bad, a, not a bad destiny. No, but a very bad man. He was. Was he very bad? Yes, he was a bad man. But he did some good things because of, because of his position, and, and he achieved his position as basically being a slavish writer for the regime. Because of his position, he was able to do good things, help people. But on the whole, it was a very, very sad career as a lickspittle and a cat's paw. And I've got a terrible feeling that it might have been me just to save my ass. But um, he had talent. And, and somehow compromised it, but it's journalistic talent, right? Um, but if, if you had solid talent, I don't think you could do it because you, your, your heart becomes gangrenous in your body when you, when you go against your talent. Um, and Borges, I think you, you, it's, a, it's a harsh reading of Borges. Um, he was it's not my reading, it's, it's actually reading of, of, of perfectly civilized Argentinians. And uh, it's, it's a recurring theme with them, and because they're trying to come to terms with a, a past that won't go away. In fact, it's probably going to come again. <laughs> uh, well, what about Céline as an example? Céline is, a, but he's a he's a perfect nightmare and monster. Yes, he is. He is. And and also, you know, if you if you write um, anti-Semitic fiction, that's one thing. If you write anti-Semitic 
how-to books about um, getting rid of Jews. Bagatelle, Bagatelles for a Massacre is one of the filthiest books that anyone ever read. It's not a, so much a matter of journey to the end of the night. Bagatelles for a Massacre is a, it's a prescription for wiping out Jews. There's a very good story about Salim, which I've only just read, actually. In 41, a lot of the French French right-wing writers went on a tour of Germany and Vienna to meet the top Nazis, Sepp Dietrich, you know, sit down together, discuss the future of Europe, United Europe. What year? 41. And uh, it was called, I think it was called the, the Schriftsteller Treffung or something, the meeting of writers. They meet the top Germans, uh, Goebbels was there, great meeting, great scene, great play. These rather second-rate French writers finally came back to Paris, and Celine met them, and he screamed at them. He said, you didn't say enough about killing Jews. There was nothing about killing Jews. I've read everything you've said. Where, where is the real subject? And of course, the Nazis, the Nazis knew the real subject, and so did Celine, but the, uh, the second-rate French writers hadn't guessed it yet. Celine was a perfect, perfect... Yeah, yeah swine. Uh, but um, do you admire him? No, I don't. But that, that, that's because I, my French isn't really good enough to read. Voyage au bout de la nuit is... A, it's supposed to meant to be a good book. I've never got far with it. No. Uh, no. Uh, but, uh, but do we allow the possibility of... Uh, of a great Nazi writer or a great... Uh, a great we're, we're much less likely to allow the possibility of a very, very great right-wing writer than a far left yeah. yeah. I say I, I don't mind putting aesthetics as the supreme criterion as long as it contains morality. It's when the two things get separate that things get... Extremely Nothing dark. can ever get separated on these. You know, it's convenient to do so for the purposes of you know, analysis, but, it, but it's all one thing. Can a, can, a, can a writer get derailed by his own subject matter? I'm, I've been fascinated for a while now by the case of Nicholson Baker, whom you put me on to, and I enjoy Nicholson Baker's books. I like, enjoyed them as a need. I thought the book about Updike was a screamingly one really an interesting book. I know you're a writer, as you said long ago, originality is talent. Um, and he is original. And he was uh, the microscopic vision and the perfect registration was... And al also the, the most, the blandest, most beautifully bland title of all time, Room Temperature. Yeah. <laughs> but then Vox, you start, it, it gets, start getting very... Sex in the head. Yeah, well, and Sex in the Hand, it was, that was the, the first uh, masturbatory book he wrote. And then, but I enjoyed it, to say, not on that level. I didn't, didn't like Vox at all. The, the Fermata had possibilities. Yeah, well, I, I, I actually uh, think the Fermata is a very, very interesting book, but it's also extremely uh, excremental and off-putting on the level of which I think he's attempting. It's a, it's Joyce is like that, too, though. It, um, an, un, an unusual interest in, in secretions. And, uh, well, you, but do you find... Uh, well, Joyce does it very beautifully. I mean, the... It's part, it's part of life. It's a, not part of my life. I've never actually written a letter to my... I think well, letters are different. To, what is it? To it's to Nora. They say, send a pair of your knickers, but make sure they're not washed. Huh? Oh, <laughs> Wear them for two weeks. And don't pull the chain. Uh, no, very curious. But, but the, the shithouse scene in, in the early pages of Ulysses is, is beautiful. One of, one of the good scenes, as indeed the, the, the last part of the book is the first part I read. And I don't think I've ever read the book consecutively in my life. And I'll certainly never do it to Finnegan's Wake. I think you're perfectly right about Finnegan's Wake. But Finnegan's Wake is a 700-page crossword clue. Um, and the, the answer is the. <laughs> <laughs> but that is style gone mad. Style can't go mad. Well, he, he did a rid ridiculous thing. Uh, you know, he, Tell a dream, lose a reader, said Henry James. And... Uh, puns are cornerly but rightly considered the lowest form of wit. So he thought, oh, well, I'll do it this way. And anyone can do them. Yeah. Dreams in puns. Um, Craig Rain did make a at least halfway telling point. He said, a book that uh, took 30 years to write. Well, you can spend some time reading it. It's not a bad point. But, uh, oh, yeah, and, and, and great big books have a way of brushing aside you know, little criticisms. Um, but it, it's more a sense of what you lose, what you've lost in Joyce. You, know, you could have had two more Ulysses. Um, my father always used to talk about introversion in, in Joyce's case. Um, and, you know, a writer should always be a, a good host. Nabokov would put you in his best armchair, serve you his best wine, and, you know, and be fussing about you. Joyce, you'd come in, and he'd be vaguely off in the kitchen somewhere making, you know... After borrowing money from you. Yeah, yeah. Right, and, and sort of, you know, looking among the old wine bottles and said, you know, I'll be out in a minute, you know. Um, he didn't love the reader. Um, 
an important point. I like the way you defend Larkin. I've done the same myself. I can't imagine how anyone ever did any, had any other attitude except to defend the, one of the great poets of our time. And I thought what has been happening has been an intellectual disaster on a particularly squalid level. And it comes out of goodwill. It came out of the goodwill of preserving his remains, publishing the letters, reordering the poems to put in the poems that he himself had cut out. And you come up with a picture of a man who is, whose work was actually infected by what it seemed to be his obsessions. It's just simply not true. His obsessions were kept for his private life. He knew what they were. He, he was historically very unlucky to have his letters and his poems come out and his biogra biography at a time when PC was you know, feeling its own. He was always unlucky to have kept them. He was... Uh, I was the li librarian in him, I think. Burning his letters would have been... He burned his notebooks, and they're apparently a real vision of <laughs> absolute hell. We can be sure of that now, because they're gone, yes. <laughs> yeah. um, but he, 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 I think he identified these weaknesses, and he kept them out of his, his own selection of his collected poems. What I thought was particularly sad about the reaction was that, having known him, not to the extent you did, but uh, I knew him reasonably well in his later life and it was impossible to imagine him being discourteous to anyone of any sex or any color anything else but punctilious gentle gentleman no as Kingsley said at his funeral he had this uh, almost effusive uh, sympathy and um, and and restrained you know sensitivity um, it was just a, a, he said you know the, these are just my private ways of going grr, you know it's it's Letting off steam. Unfortunate. I mean, also, you know, as a social being and a, as a discursive being, he should have, he should not have allowed these inherited propositions to, he should have examined them and seen that they are cliches of a different kind. Uh, he didn't do that. And that was part of his, you know, in, his screwed upness. Yeah, there were neuroses. Yeah. One of those old style, was it natural screwed up guy? Screwed up guy. I mean, that, I said there's more insight in that than, than the 600 pages of the biography. I don't mean to suggest that uh, in your criticism that you, uh, you necessarily uh, worship every writer on every level, particularly the ones you admire most. And uh, um, you, knew, you knew Larkin's limitations as a human being, and if possible as an artist, although as an artist I didn't think he had many. But uh, I particularly like the way you write about Bellow. And uh, he obviously means a hell of a lot to you personally um, and as an artist. He does, and um, uh, I get more and more you know, privately overwhelmed by how good I think he is. I think he's certainly the greatest American writer. There's so much in the prose, isn't it? That, 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 that's nutritious prose in a, in a way that... Uh... It's weight of voice, and it's, it's, it's not a stylistic trick as it sometimes seems in Nabokov. It's, uh, it's weight of soul is really what it is. I love the way when you unpack a sentence of Bellow, you're actually unpacking perceptions, experiences. Uh, he condenses. He gives you. He gives you so much. But let, let me raise the question here, in, in the most awkward and sensitive possible point: Is does it ever bother you that, for example, Bellow? How many times has he been married now? Five. Now, is the and it's that's not hard to it's not hard to guess that the previous wife is cropping up as a character in the latest novel and so on. Is this is this proper? Is this well, as as Philip Roth said, when a writer is born into into a family, that's the end of that family. <laughs> <laughs> but it, but it isn't. It's not true. It's the end of a whole street. <laughs> so no <a> clan. <laughs> but it isn't true. Um, and I, you know, I don't know quite what Philip Roth had to suffer in that department. I know he, well, he, I can't he's written, you know, he's written to redress the the distortions that have been saddled on his family with. I would, I wouldn't try and catch Billow out on that point. I would, I, I would say his attitude on Israel would be regarded as simplistic, even especially by liberal Israelis who happen to live there. He, uh, he wrote one book about Israel, which I simply thought wasn't very good journalism. It was brilliantly written, but... To Jerusalem and back, where I don't think he, the, the Arabs, the Arab point of view has much gone into. Right? <laughs> you can say that uh, again. <laughs> well, James Wood, a marvellous critic, one of the few remaining uh, critics, um, wrote that he, wrote, he was reviewing the disgraceful biography of, of Bellow, 
where the bio biographer James Atlas gets himself in a taking about the fact that a, a, an entirely sympathetic minor character in Humboldt's Gift was based on a friend of Bella's, who was very upset. And uh, James Wood, I think, crossed a good line when he said, uh, well, that's just too bad. <laughs> you know, it doesn't, in the end, matter whether this, um, this guy who you know, works in tiling uh, minds that he's a sympathetic character. In a, it doesn't matter, um, I'm afraid. You know. Whenever I'm uh, making fun of Mailer, which one way or another, and sometime or another, we've all done for some of his crazy opinions and actions, I try to remind myself that he wrote The Naked and the Dead. Oh, I'm, much, I'm reading with Norman on Friday night. Yeah. yeah. In New York. Oh, in New York. Yeah. We were about to leave for the airport. I've always wanted to do an interview with you when you're on the way to the airport. Right? <laughs> but if somebody told me I'd be reading with Norman Mailer t 30 years ago, I'd have said, hmm, I'll settle for that. Um, but, but Harlot's Ghost is a great book. Uh, the Oswald book is terrific. That was going to be my point. Is not only did he write The Naked and Dead, he's got this disconcerting ability to do it again, especially after you've counted him out. And uh, Harlot's Ghost is an extraordinary piece of work. Extraordinary. Um, in fact, uh, the idea that uh, there, are, there are no second acts in American lives is bullshit. Uh, always was. Um, and medical science is, you know, Bellow wrote Ravelstein at published Ramstein at the age of 85. Uh, I once took apart uh, one of Mailer's books with a book about Marilyn, which is a, I thought a, is a, <coughs> a joy piece of extremely questionable research and, and, and argument. And I really took it to bits. And then I met him in the back of a limousine in New York about five years later. And I know exactly the way writers remember reviews. I thought I was going to get punched out, even though he was with his current family. And he couldn't have been nicer. No, he, no. And there's no more threatening looking man. Have you, have you ever seen a neck like that on a writer? His ears sit on top of it like, <laughs> like bookends on a shawl. <laughs> I thought he was going to deck me, but he, he did. He was, he was very nice. Well, what was that line where he looks into the eyes of the heavyweight champion? Oh, that was Sonny Liston. He, he actually, I think he was writing about Muhammad Ali. And it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a classic piece of melee. It's, this, is, this is the high style uh, tax to the limit. He actually suggests to the reader that when he and Liston faced each other at this bar, Mayla says, I thought I saw a flicker of fear in Liston's eye. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, a man bold enough to write something as silly as that. Is <laughs> no, that's what's so great about him. In that um, oral, or better say verbal, biography of him, you know, incredibly damaging, um, he was a very wild guy. He couldn't sleep without a fist fight. One puncture point that we could never get over is he actually did stick a knife in one of his wives to see what it felt like and it didn't feel like very good for her by all reports. No, it was a serious incident but he was uh, crazed on drugs I mean, uh, and booze. Uh, no doubt he was. Yeah. I know, well... Uh, Last time you were crazed on booze and drugs did you stick a knife in anybody to find out what it felt like? No. Existentialism he was calling it. Yeah. yeah. Um, does this affect his book? Uh, then, see, that's worse than silliness. I think over the Jack Abbott case, it was silly. Yeah. Actually, the, the Jack Abbott case came out of a good side of his nature. He thought Jack Abbott, who was a prisoner, who was a talented writer, did a lot, did, along with the New York Review of Books, did a lot to get Jack, Jack Abbott sprung. Jack Abbott rewarded Mailer and all the people who got him out of jail by uh, the first night he was in, in a wait, he was in a restaurant, he, he stabbed a waiter and killed him, promising young writer. And, uh, and Mailer we would have thought would have been obliged to admit when he was quizzed about it on television that he made an error and he said you know, he said something very very silly about i think it was a challenge to the suburbs or something existential crap again eh? so yeah inte literary integrity is worth a few you know, losses in the suburbs if you're talking about a man who really can't talk sense unless he's producing art it does introduce an extraordinary division in the mind doesn't this well i mean I, it's become completely clear to me you know over the last 30 years of my life that, um, that fiction, at any rate, doesn't come from the front of the brain, but from the back. Um, so all the, all the dross in the frontal brain is, is sidestepped by the unconscious. Um, you know, that is what talent means. Um, so, I, you know, you can, up to a point, you can separate them.
I think you're, uh, you're commendably brave about finding something unreadable when it is, even though its reputation is international, huge, and continuous, like uh, Don Quixote, which you uh, laugh. Didn't enjoy. Totally unreadable. There's, well, the second half. What does unreadable mean? Is it the inability to continue is what I would... Um, the unreadability means you wouldn't do it unless you, you, you were reviewing it. And you know that nothing is going to happen in the next few pages to... And you're constantly wondering what else you could be doing. You know, I, I've actually got a book like that in my life. It's The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, which I've been reading now for 40 years, and I'll never get past volume one, because Gibbon's style is highly crafted, fantastically intricate, baroque, indeed, rococo, but basically unreadable, because it's all style. He's incapable of a, of a, of a statement, <clears throat> of making a statement in a way that merits the case. I mean, he's sort of cultish too, isn't he? He's, yeah, the, the sort of eight-part sentence, all carefully balanced, exists in itself as a construction. And I think there is such a thing as a style that gets, uh, that gets out of control through being too controlled. Well, then it's not a proper style. Um, style should, should, you know, is, is just an expression of perception. Um, it's not something poured on afterwards. It's, it's inherent in how you perceive. Um, and if, if the reader is is constantly stubbing his toe and veering back, then it's because the style isn't a true style. It's it's an imposed one. Well, I think you better get to the airport and stub your toe on Norman Mailer, and we'll do this again. Up.